team. It's a very exciting uh, collaboration between two amazing Israeli organisations and their supporters in Australia. So we have the Australian Friends of Rambam and the Ariel University Fund of Australia. And it's wonderful to be able to see some collaboration between two leading technology uh, contributors and to see them working together to provide some amazing people um, and some really insightful discussions today about COVID-19. And especially, I think, during these times as we're coming out of our, um, some of the more restrictive period, at least for the moment, I think a lot of us have a lot of questions and we're very, very lucky that we have uh, amazing people tonight to be able to help us uh, answer some of these questions um, and they're actually people that know what they're talking about as opposed to everyone else that sits around my table at my house at least. Uh, so we're going to have a panel of three, Professor Shai Ashkenazi who's the Dean of Ariel University's uh, Dr Miriam and Sheldon Adelson School of Medicine and this has just been open for two months, correct me if I'm wrong. So that's really, really an exciting and momentous occasion. Thank you, Professor, for joining us. And we have Dr. Oren Caspi, who's the Head of Advanced Heart Failure Program at Rumbum Healthcare Campus, um, and also part associated with, works with the Technion. Um, and also you, uh, Dr. Caspi is the Head of the COVID-19 Technological Developments. Um, and Dr. Ami Neuberger is the attending physician in the Infectious Diseases Unit and the Impar uh, Department of Internal yeah. Medicine B at Rumbum Healthcare yeah. Campus. Um, so just some amazing people to hear from. I'm really excited to hear from you all. And thank you very much for your time and your expertise and for your contributions to this uh, really difficult issue for all of us. Before we start though, we thought we would just talk a little bit or hear from, um, from Robin Schiffman, who is the chair of uh, Friend, Australian Friends of Rumbum. And he, together with Vered and the rest of the board have worked tirelessly to do an amazing job of raising the profile of the Rumbum in Australia. So thank you for that. And then we're gonna hear from Adrian Treger, who is part of the executive at Ariel University and he has also been working tirelessly to bring awareness of all the incredible things that Ariel University does. And I'd encourage you, um, everyone who's attending tonight, thank you to you all for attending. And if you haven't been, if you're coming because of Vered and you haven't explored what Ariel University is doing, or if you're coming because of Adrian and you haven't explored what Rambam is doing, I, I'm blessed that I've been able to tour both campuses and they're both amazing places and well worth uh, a look and well worth, of course, our support both emotionally um, and financially. And uh, I will thank them both for, um, and the rest of their institutions for being the incredible places that they are. Now, um, over to you, Robin. Thank you, Harriet. Australian Friends of Rambam uh, is a charity registered uh, in Australia um, to support and promote um, Rambam Healthcare Centre um, to the Australian community. Um, and we do this in a number of ways um, through uh, educational programs, through um, uh, visits by um, dignitaries from Rambam, um, through fundraising, of course. Um, and then we also promote um, improvements to uh, health and well-being of the Australian community. And we do this through the Circle of Health program uh, that we run. Now, Circle of Health um, is part of Australian Friends of Rambam. Um, and we offer education and information, but also opportunities for participants to physically participate through such things as Rambam Ride, uh, Yoga, Cardio Workouts. 
that's in normal times. In these very unusual times with COVID-19, um, much of that has had to go online uh, through Zoom, um, but it is definitely still going and you can um, get in touch uh, online through osforum.org.au forward slash circle of health program. Um, so uh, tonight is part of circle of health and um, we are joining, as you know, together with, uh, with Ariel um, to have a look into the future uh, and ask the question uh, of COVID-19, whether this is just the beginning. Um, and to help with that, uh, we're very privileged to have experts, as Harriet mentioned earlier, um, from both Ariel and Rambam. And, um, we invite you to uh, to listen then to join in. Uh, thank you and back to you, Harriet. Thank you. I will hand the floor over to Adrian to tell us a little bit about Ariel uh, before we get started. Thank you, Harriet. And uh, thank you to everyone who's joined us. And of course, thank you to that, our superb uh, lineup of panelists. We really appreciate you all making uh, the time to, to do the panel tonight. Um, firstly, uh, Australian Friends of uh, our University or RLU Fun uh, was started in 2019 uh, with uh, amazing help from our, our board to set it up. Um, we are working towards establishing a number of projects um, in Australia, whether it be working conjunction with local Australian universities and finding projects can be of help to uh, the local diaspora community in Australia and then maybe we can bring from our expertise. And of course, the general aspects such as uh, the incredible research Professor Ashkenazi is doing on COVID-19. Um, we're looking forward, please God, to doing our launch in 2020, as soon as uh, the lockdown allows us, and uh, give a hats off to our, our board for trying to bring that together in a very difficult situation. Um, a bit about our university. Uh, we're Israel's newest university. and uh, We became a full university in 2012. Um, we offer um, exciting, unique courses in things such as Onology, the only school that teaches winemaking in Israel. Um, we are lucky to offer our students opportunity to do research in, for example, uh, what's acknowledged as the world leader in compact particle accelerators. So we're young, but we're excited and we're energetic. Um, and we're uh, very excited to be part of uh, the startup nation of Israel um, in every aspect of what we're doing. Um, and we've been very excited in the uh, beginning stages of developing relationship in Australia with absolutely amazing response and warmth and embrace of the Australian community. And we thank you all for that. Back to you, Harriet. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And um, I'm a little bit unused to this technology. So I'm, as before we get started, as we get speakers coming coming forward, I believe that if you use the chat function, you can uh, you can put questions there, and we can present them to the panelists at the end. I think that's probably the easiest way to go forward if everyone's in agreement. Okay, so uh, without further ado, we will get started with Professor Ashkenazi. Um, and if you could uh, take the floor and your, get started on your views of COVID-19, and we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, and sorry, my apologies, Dr. Well, it doesn't really matter. I thought Dr. Professor Ashkenazi was going first, so we'll, we'll leave it at that, that's fine. Thank you, Professor. Okay, thank you very much. It's really my pleasure to see you all and speak with you. You know, the, there are many aspects to discuss on the COVID-19. And as an infectious disease specialist and as someone who worked with the vaccines and immunology, we are concentrating on the very strange and unusual aspects of immune dysregulation with regard to the coronavirus. 
uh, outbreak. And uh, uh, this will help us to develop vaccination against the disease, either passive or active vaccination. So I tried in about 10 minutes to describe uh, what I am talking about. First of all, it's clear that the immune system is critical to overcome every infection, including the COVID-19. Our immune system developed antibodies and cellular immunities to overcome the infection. That's uh, clear and that's part of the idea of having a vaccine to prevent the disease. However, what we learn in the recent weeks is that the immune system that had to fight for the virus, sometimes there is what we call immune dysregulation and our immune system causes damage, causes severe disease. And they, what in a typical cases of the severe cases of uh, coronavirus, seven to 10 days after the onset of the disease, when you have upper respiratory infection, flu-like influenza-like disease with fever and runny nose and cough and some shortness of breath, suddenly there is severe deterioration which is caused by actually by hyperinflammation, over activity of our immune system. And because of this overactivity, the whole immune system is working too much or too hard, causing damage and multi-system failure. And the, this overactivity of the immune system, what we call immune overregulation or dysregulation, has a severe impact of the heart, mucocutaneously in terms of rash and uh, uh, conjunctivitis, kidney failure, and this is actually the cause of uh, artificial ventilation and death of uh, adult, what we call ARDS. And I'm sure we'll hear in a few minutes about the myocardial involvement. And in children, we have a, 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 a syndrome like Kawasaki-like, in which you have, again, rash and mucous membranes involvement and the myocardial involvement. Uh, in Israel, we had four children with this uh, hyperinflammation. They all recovered after intensive care. But in uh, the UK, in, uh, in uh, the US, there were some fatal cases as well, one in Belgium. So what the uh, I'm trying to do with the team, with our immunologist, is to have a research to see what can we learn from this strange immune function and help the, the, uh, our patients in the future. So we have, a, we are plan to take uh, blood specimens of those who have recovered from coronavirus children at the Schneider Children Hospital in Petar Tikva, where, where I headed the Department uh, of Pediatrics A, which became the coronavirus department. So children recovered from coronavirus and adults from Hasharon Hospital. Hasharon Hospital was the, the whole hospital was coronavirus uh, centered. So we take blood specimens of those who have recovered and divide them into several groups, those who have very mild disease, very severe disease, those who were ventilated, and will have an, a, an unsymptomatic control, others who were not sick at all. Of course, after having already the ethics committee approval and written informed consent from the patient. So we take three blood specimens and follow in details the immune response in terms of the repertoire of T cells, which is a bit complicated, and cytokines, this patient with a severe disease have what we call cytokines a storm. There is a storm of cytokines. So by following these uh, patients and elucidating the detailed immune response, we'll try to learn what happened with the most severe cases and the milder cases. And on this basis, suggest novel approaches to these patients. For instance, in those adults and children with the hyperinflammation, we might need something to suppress the immune system. 
So we, this is the work which will, will take some time. We have applied for the Israel Science Foundation for a, 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 a grant for this uh, study, but we are going to do it. And in the last uh, three minutes, I will mention about the vaccine approach to the coronavirus, mainly emphasizing uh, vaccine studies in Israel. So our approach will be to have a passive vaccination based on the elucidation of the immune response. Now there are two uh, companies, the groups in Israel that are working on the coronavirus vaccine. One is the Migal Institute in the Galilee, in the northern part of Israel. And they actually are ahead of others because they have already developed a vaccine against chicken coronavirus. Now we know there is 87, 85, 90% homology with the new coronavirus, the COVID-19. So now they're trying to adopt the vaccine developed for the chicken coronavirus to human coronavirus. And the, another uh, a group which is working on the vaccine is the Biologic Institute in Israel. Uh, they are trying to have an active vaccine as well as a passive vaccine. Passive vaccine are immune parameters, immune components that you give for those who are very sick to get to have a immediate protection. Active vaccine, you vaccinate and you get the immune system to respond and develop uh, immune uh, uh, antibodies and T cell, and then you are protected for uh, hopefully years or many months. So these are the two approaches in Israel. As you know, there are obviously other approach, the, uh, very developed is the Moderna, the company in California who are working on the uh, uh, RNA-based vaccine. They did already phase one studies with a few dozens and they planned the phase two studies. So overall, I think we may, in medicine, we like to have basic research, basic science and clinical science and put them together. This is the key to success. So hopefully the lab studies, which will elucidate the immune response and, and the, compare them to the clinical outcome of the patients and the other research studies will really help us for the future. So this is what I had to say. And if there are questions now or later, obviously. Thank you very much, Professor Ashkenazi. That was really helpful and insightful. We're now going to hear from Dr. Oren Caspi. And everyone, I don't see any questions and answers yet, but uh, the, the doctors will be available at the end to, uh, to answer questions. Over to you, Dr. Caspi. Hi, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'll talk today about a system that we developed in order to monitor the disease and I'll share with you my screen in a second. So, what we developed, and it's a, it's a, it's a, one of the, there are some good things in the uh, corona crisis, is that we learned uh, uh, in Israel, in, in wo worldwide, that we need multidisciplinary co co collaborations to cope with a chaotic environment. And it's a, a, a volunteer work of engineers, physicians, data scientists, and people from the army. And what we devise is a geodemographic platform for monitoring the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, the overarching hypothesis that we had, or why we are here, is that we that geodemographic tools uh, for COVID-19 outbreak mitigation and relief will be instrumental both for life-saving and economical revival. And what we actually do is that we do mathematical analysis of the disease trajectory. So we look at each and every geographical area and analyze the, the disease trajectory in each area as a separate geographical unit. And we established a tool set uh, uh, for COVID-19 risk at this geographical unit, so we can um, tailor the specific mitigation 
um, like lockdown or a, a curfew that were used, or relief measures to that geographical unit. We were able to identify hotspots and specifically also uh, classify them according to hotspots with severe morbidity or expected severe morbidity according to the demographical data, age distribution and comorbidities. And two additional projects that we did only in Israel together with the Ministry of Health is to look at the hospital-based disease trajectory. So, you know, this is the a, a, a unique case of uh, healthcare um, uh, contingency. So we don't have enough uh, uh, physicians. We don't have, uh, uh, we were expecting a, a, a state that we didn't have enough staff, enough equipment, and we need to be very efficient. So we want to uh, allocate the staff and the physicians and the uh, uh, um, ventilators according to the need at specific hospitals, but also according to the trajectory in those specific hospitals. So we devised a model for uh, analyzing the hospital uh, disease burden, uh, and I will show you that. And finally, there is a, a very nice project in Israel called uh, the Protectors of Mothers and Fathers. Uh, and this project focuses on the nursing homes, which uh, became a, a unique place in these aspects of severe morbidity. Actually, the main uh, origin for severe morbidity uh, worldwide. And the, we, we help the MOH in order, to, the Minister of Health in Israel, in order to monitor the nursing homes uh, within Israel and to uh, analyze the trajectories of morbidities uh, within Israel. So I'll show you how our system works. So we are all volunteers. Um, people coming from uh, the Technion, Rampa Medical Center, and the Israeli uh, Defense Force Medical Corps. And what we do uh, in our background, we are part of home defense and we do data analytics. And as you can see, we have these uh, circles. The size of the circle is the burden of the disease, but the color, which is most, most important here, is the trajectory of the disease. And we were able to analyze the data and the outbreaks and to identify uh, very early uh, the main outbreaks in Israel. Uh, I'll, I'll skip to the system for a second to show you the system. Just a second. Okay. So this is our website. It's uh, open for the public. You can see the US now and it's called covid19maps.org and you see the circles. So the size of the circle is the burden of disease and in the States you can see New York, which is the largest burden of the disease in uh, the United States, but you can also see the rate of disease spread. So the color of the circle and the trajectory of the disease is shown by the, the color of the circle. Red colors or warm colors uh, actually indicate that the disease spread rate is very fast. And cold colors like blue actually indicate that the disease spread is slow. So we can say that uh, currently in Northern Florida, there is no burden of disease and the disease spread is slow. We can uh, uh, use the system to identify areas for uh, uh, relief measures. However, when we look at uh, areas uh, like uh, Dallas, Texas, or um, uh, specific areas in California, uh, the, the Chicago suburbs, this area have disease burden and high spread rate of the disease or uh, 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 outbreak potential. So we can say that these area are in the greatest risk and then we, in those areas we should focus our examinations efforts, we should 
uh, um, uh, focus all the mitigation efforts that we have. Um, I will show you a little bit of the um, other stuff that we do. This is the nursing home project. So you can see here all the nursing homes in Israel. So we can monitor uh, in which nursing homes we have the disease. The one interesting thing about it is that the nursing home uh, uh, mobility relates to the city mobility and also uh, if they are adjacent to each other because the staff uh, works at the, at the same nursing homes, so uh, the mobility is transferred by the staff. So we can uh, monitor the disease burden, the trends of the disease burden, and to identify this area in which we uh, actively or proactively uh, can do uh, examinations to identify new outbreaks. Finally, I wanted to show you the global map. So we have an additional global map, which can, just a second, which can monitor the world and we, we can see uh, uh, areas like Australia with low spread rate like uh, now and areas with high spread rate like Southern America currently and uh, Mongolia, uh, which is the, uh, which have the highest uh, spread rate currently. I'll go back to the um, presentation in a second and, and to a summary slide. So what we do is data analytics to identify the disease trajectories. We can classify them according to hot and cold spot identification. We add also risk certification to uh, identify geographical units with severe disease uh, uh, potential. Uh, using the, the demographic data and the comorbidities, and we can classify them, the geographical units, according uh, to the risk. And then we can couple the mitigation or the relief measures that we do uh, uh, in order to allow economical revival on one side and uh, life-saving and effective mitigation efforts on the other side. Uh, what we currently do is take all this system into a machine learning, uh, algorithm, actually a gradient boosted decision tree algorithm uh, that will make it uh, much more efficient that, uh, than what, what, what we currently do. Uh, this system was adopted by the Ministry of Health, by the Home Defense of Israel, and it is currently used uh, by them in order to mitigate the disease in Israel. So thank you, and we, I will be very happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Caspi. That was fascinating. Uh, do you want to, I understand you have to go. Do you want to take uh, any questions now or are you happy to wait a few more minutes until after Dr. Neuberger's presentation? I figure I can wait until uh, um, Ami's presentation, so that will be okay. Okay, lovely. Thank you, that's great. All right, uh, and our final speaker for this evening, Dr. Neuberger. Um, and we will then, I see we've got one question uh, already. Thank you very much. Please keep them coming through. We want to uh, get, make the most of this amazing panel while we can. Over to you. Hi. Um, I would be less scientific and more practical, if I may. Um, I would like to talk about a new experience for me, as a, not as a young doctor. And that experience is how do I treat patients with a disease which I don't know, with a virus which is a new thing in history, actually in modern history, and a disease which behaves like no other. Um, and this has several, um, several aspects, actually. Uh, first of all, the most basic challenge is the, uh, is the medical challenge. Um, we are used to giving medications which are preferably not harmful and we know they have proven benefit. You hear the loudspeaker encouraging us to wash our hands. So, uh, we are giving medications to patients when we judge that the harms are much less than the benefits the medications would provide. 
but in such an uh, in, in such an outbreak, we have to treat patients with anything without any proof, and we could go on making several mistakes. We could give useless medication or even harmful medication to patients because we want to do something, or we might be too afraid to use new stuff and then. Of, um, um, uh, cause patients to, to be harmed by lack of treatment. Uh, this is even more serious because patients with uh, COVID-19 behave like no other patients. Uh, the disease first is quite long. Uh, we are used to uh, most viral infections which are relatively short and patients with COVID-19 uh, develop multi-organ failure, they need mechanical ventilation and resuscitation, usually after 7, 10 days, 14 days, even more uh, of disease, which is quite long. Um, these patients that deteriorate develop a multi-organ phenomena with the failure of the respiratory system, uh, heart problems, blood clots problems in the lungs and elsewhere, uh, autoimmune disease or uh, immune dysregulation, uh, as you've heard, the, the, actually the immune system attacks the body uh, in a reverse logic. Um, and to treat this without pre prior knowledge is quite, is quite difficult. That's a medical challenge. Psychological challenges are actually, there are a few of them. First of all, uh, patients. Patients are afraid, at least in the beginning of this outbreak. Every patient that came, even those with extremely mild disease, which were practically healthy, were terrified. Terrified to be isolated, terrified of the medical staff. And um, this is understandably so. And um, the families of these patients at first could not talk to them, could not hug them, could not support them. Uh, um, they have lost a relative to this vague system, dark, uh, dark, isolated universe which they cannot enter. Um, so psychological stress was also very, very uh, pronounced among family members. And finally, among staff members, people are afraid to be sick. Uh, doctors, nurses with uh, maybe ill parents or, or young children, maybe themselves are not young anymore, or they, they have some chronic illness. Um, at least in the beginning, there was a shortage of uh, protective gear, not only here, also in the States and in Europe. Uh, so people were understandably uh, quite uh, edgy. Um, we had also to take care of that. And finally, the ethical issues. The ethical issues is how, how well, first, um, how much to treat a patient who is very, very old, maybe with a lot of background illnesses, maybe with a cognitive decline or dementia. Um, do we perform mechanical ventilation? Uh, do we perform chest compressions and uh, resuscitation? Generally, the general direction in Israel is uh, very proactive medicine. Uh, we, we perform more resuscitation uh, than most countries in Europe and in the States. But uh, some of the patients were extremely ill also before they contracted COVID-19. And these ethical issues, uh, of course, are, uh, are quite an issue, especially when you have to make them when the family and the patient cannot even communicate properly. Um, the other ethical question, which we luckily did not face, is shortage of uh, mechanical ventilation. Uh, possibilities. Uh, in New York City and in Italy, they did face these issues. Uh, in northern Israel, we did not have so many cases, but also in hospital uh, in Jerusalem and in the Tel Aviv area, uh, there was no shortage this time of, uh, of equipment. So luckily, we avoided this very, very difficult uh, issue. Um, I think it's better to shorten and wait for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really fantastic to hear from you all. And so to move, we've had a few questions. Some of them also have come up for some reason. Some people could only message 
privately for some reason, but we'll start with the ones that are on the open question and answer section of the Zoom panel. Uh, I ha we have one question, uh, well, two related questions. I'm wondering if it's safe to visit Gary Smorgan House tomorrow in Melbourne. Also, if I should go, should I wear a mask? And the person asking the question is 68 with heart issues herself, but she really wants to see her friend who has ALS. Whoever would hey, like to answer that um, from the panelists, because she's could the person visit their friend who has ALS um, if she's 68 with a heart condition herself. Well, I can start, it's okay. I don't know the situation in Melbourne, but uh, obviously uh, older persons with the heart disease, underlying disease is at risk a person. And uh, it's recommended to have a mask. It uh, can help for a short period of time. So it's really recommended. Now, obviously all, it depends upon the amount of disease in the area that you would like to visit. I'm not sure about the details in Melbourne. I've been in Melbourne, but it was 10 years ago. So I'm not sure the, about the coronavirus there. But certainly if someone wants to visit, a mask is recommended. And another thing, what is called social distancing, I would like to call it physical distancing, it's not social, to stay uh, uh, two meters about uh, six feet from the other person. So this will be the answer to this uh, question on my side. Okay, social distancing, masks, and uh, the, 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 th the usual recommendations that we have here in Australia as well as Israel. Thank you for that. Um, and we have another question, which I was also thinking about. I'd like to say great minds think alike, but I think the person asking the question, I know him, he's, he's got a great mind. <laughs> um, President Trump has been taking hydroxychloroquine. Um, does the panel feel there is any basis for this? Well, hydroxychloroquine is a medication used for malaria or parasitic diseases, but there is some logic, some uh, medic, some science behind the idea that it might be helpful for the coronavirus changing the pH of the vesicle. Now, it's obviously, it's not recommended for prevention, like President Trump has declared. If you are healthy, you don't need to take hydroxychloroquine. As every medication, there are side effects, there are toxic effects, so it's not, recommended for someone who is healthy. Number two, it's not recommended for someone who has a very mild coronavirus disease. You don't need the hydroxychloroquine. About the most severe cases, we had in Israel a few hundreds of cases who were, who were ventilated and were very sick, because there is some science behind the idea, they got hydroxychloroquine, and they, some of them improved, or many of them improved, but we are not sure. There, are, there is in the literature some controversy. There are publications that say that it's improving the disease, some not. We are not sure. You know, in regular times, when we don't have an epidemic, we physicians like to have what we call double-blind study. You take 1,000 persons with a disease, you treat with the medication. Another 1,000 is uh, giving a placebo something which is not active chemically or another medication, and you compare. We don't have this observation with regard to the coronavirus. We don't have the control that we need. Only we have observations. So the bottom line, what is recommended in many locations, and we wrote the guidelines in Israel, for severe case, it's a known medication. We know the side effects. So severe case, we go ahead and use it. Obviously not for prophylaxis like President Trump has mentioned. If you are healthy, don't take it. For how long will you take it? So this is the current knowledge. It might change in the future, of course. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, fourth question, how widespread and why is the virus spreading to children? Why is the virus not spreading or spreading to children? Why is the virus, the question is why, how widespread and why is the virus spreading to children? Okay. <clears throat> so we know that the virus is spread through the secretions of the respiratory tract, droplet infection, airborne infection. And uh, this virus is very infectious. That's why I'm afraid the virus might stay with us for a long time. There are some examples that a single person in a social event infected dozens. There was a, a, an event in, in South uh, Korea when someone in the church infected dozens. Only two, years, two days ago in New York, they opened a ceremony for some reason and one person who was a, a sick infected dozens. So it's, it's infectious, it's a very infectious. Uh, uh, B, which is bothering, is that even someone who is asymptomatic doesn't feel any sickness, but was infected with the virus, can transmit it to others. That's why the virus is spreading as, a, as, as opposed to SARS, for instance. In SARS, 20% mortality, very severe disease, but we knew who has the disease, we, we could isolate them. Here, it's a very mild disease, even if you are asymptomatic, you can spread the disease. Now, it's interesting about children. We know that in most respiratory diseases like influenza, the flu that we have every year, children have the highest rate of disease. They, don't, they have less complication, they, they don't die, luckily, but they are spreader of influenza because children don't keep hygiene and they don't have antibodies. With the coronavirus, it's very interesting. The global experience in Israel as well, in other countries, children are affected less frequently than adults and they have less severe disease. We are not sure why we know that the coronavirus is a, actually a family of viruses. So maybe children were exposed to other coronaviruses and are, have partial protection but children are involved with this epidemic less than adults, and the severity is also lower. Although again, as I mentioned, there are some children with the hyperinflammation syndrome, we had four in Israel, and uh, uh, worldwide there are children who died, unfortunately. But they are affected less commonly than adults. Thank you, okay. And uh, I've got a question for Dr. Caspi uh, that someone sent through via private message. It was, given the mapping that you've done, do you think it's possible for COVID-19 to disappear? Oh, this is a, the, the million dollar question. So I don't think we have an answer for that. Uh, I think that we, as, as a society, can um, uh, mitigate the outbreak effectively if we will try and uh, 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 concentrate all efforts to identify outbreaks early enough. Um, I, I, you know, I think that the only solution for uh, the, the disappearance of morbidity would be a vaccination. And once we, have, we will have vaccination, this will be a very effective way uh, uh, to allow that. Uh, I would like to add some uh, data about the, the two uh, uh, aforementioned questions. One about the morbidity in Melbourne. Melbourne currently have only 100 cases, active cases of COVID-19. The population is 5 million, around 5 million, if I'm not wrong. And uh, so the disease burden in, in uh, Melbourne is, is very low uh, comparing to other parts of the world. Uh, of course, the way to um, uh, behave is the way that the Ministry of Health in Melbourne and in, in Australia uh, directs the, the, the people. And I will share with you my screen just to, sh to talk about um, hydroxychloroquine and the Trump strategy for a second. So this is the best uh, data that we have currently about hydroxychloroquine. 
Um, this is an observational study, not a randomized one that we like uh, more, but uh, in an observational study published in the New England, there was no effect of hydroxychloroquine. I think Ami can uh, give it additional information about that, uh, but uh, we, we need to wait to be to, to more um, data regarding drugs. Hydroxychloroquine as a prevention is very uh, um, um, uh, dangerous, uh, uh, as, uh, at least for me as a cardiologist, one of the side effects is arrhythmias and fatal arrhythmias, so we, we need uh, to be much more uh, accurate about what we decide uh, to use or not, and I think that we, there is no medical recommendation uh, to use hydroxychloroquine as a preventive measure right now. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'm conscious that we are reaching the time that we promised, but you know, like all good functions with the good discussion, we might want to continue. Um, Verit, as the um, person that has brought the event together, what would you like to do? Should we continue with a few more questions? Yes, yes. We have some uh, few more questions that actually I've sent you because they sent it to me uh, privately. So just have a look. Okay. Yes, yes. I'm scrolling through. So um, there's one for Dr. Neuberger. Um, it's actually kind of a, a few of the questions that have come in. Uh, so I'll roll them together to try and be efficient. The first part is um, we've got uh, a lot of Asian countries seem to have done really well in controlling this outbreak. And of course, um, we all know that they're very good at wearing face masks. So is the face mask an effective preventer? And then we've heard from someone else, what sort of face masks are effective? So I suppose I'm guessing that what that question's about is, at least in Australia, you see people selling fashion masks or just the plain surgical masks that we're used to seeing and then others that are really super fancy. Um, so does any mask work or is, is there something special that you should be looking for in a mask? Okay. First, first of all, I want to be a bearer of bad news in regarding hydroxychloroquine. A new study, a randomized controlled trial has been completed with the use of this medication, and it's an absolutely useless medication. Uh, I wish good health to President Trump, but a randomized controlled trial show absolutely no benefit for sick people, certainly not for preventing disease. Absolutely useless. Um, regard, uh, that could be come up in the British Medical Journal very soon, or maybe it has been published, I'm not sure. Uh, regarding the face masks, nobody has done any trial on COVID-19 prevention using masks and non-masks, but it makes a lot of sense. Uh, the disease is spread by respiratory droplets. If you sneeze and you wear a mask, your viruses will not get as far as if you sneeze without a mask. Um, so it certainly would prevent you from infecting other people. Um, the thicker the mask, the smaller the holes of the fabric it's made of is probably more efficient. And surgical masks probably have some efficiency, certainly not 100% protective. The, the N95 masks, which are a bit more expensive, um, would probably be more effective in, in protection the individual. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I've got another open question. Um, so, uh, Doctor, uh, this is from uh, someone with a medical background, so I hope I express this correctly because I do not have a medical background. From Dr. Caspi's model, you can see that the disease trajectory does not relate to local disease load and does not continue to be logarithmic does the panel think that viral character characteristics change as the local pandemic progresses? I guess that's one for Dr. Caspi, yes. Um, 
I, I'm not sure that I understood the question. So, but I, I can. Uh, uh, one part of the question was was whether we see a a, a, a coupling between the disease burden and disease di spread dynamics, and uh, sometimes there is a, a, a such coupling. But when we identify new outbreaks, that this means that we don't see this coupling, and. Um, the the focus on the of the of the system is in all is is on identifying the er, early enough the the outbreaks the, the geographical units we, that actually uh, uh, this, this exponential uh, rise of cases and this is this is the uh, uh, the issue here um, so this is our uh, main contribution uh, to take this mathematical modeling and to uh, present it in a way that uh, policymakers can analyze the data uh, uh, in a geographical map and uh, take decisions upon it. Okay, and um, just another question for Dr. Neuberger. Uh, will there be um, how, sorry, how long will it take to get a, uh, it's really the golden question, how long will it take to get a vaccine for COVID-19? <laughs> That's in a tough one. Let me quote Mark Twain in response. Prophecy is a good line of business, but it is full of risks. Um, I think that would be a problem to mention specific time. No vaccine is actually close to completion. So at the best, six months could be longer, could be years. Nobody knows. No vaccine has moved in, be, beyond phase two trials. There is phase one, you check if the vaccine is safe. Phase two, if it produces uh, antibodies in the, in the patients. And only in phase three, study, uh, you check if it actually protects people. Still a very, very long way to go. Okay, I think we might have uh, time for one, uh, well, I'll try and get two more questions in. There seems to be sort of two along, sort of two lines of thought. There's different variations of. The first one is sort of going back to the question before that was asked to Dr. Caspi about, you know, localised uh, COVID-19. This one is, it, there's the rumour, as we all hear them, um, where experts are expecting a second wave of COVID-19 in conjunction with an extremely difficult influenza. So does this complicate treatment for COVID-19? Ami, do you want to take the question? Yeah, bye, Owen. See you soon. Bye. Um, Owen, thank you, so much, a, thank you so uh, much, Dr. Caspi. Thank you so much, Dr. Caspi. You have here. Thank, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Um, there have been prophets giving very optimistic prophecies here in Israel, saying no more than 10 people will die, which actually came from a Nobel laureate. Uh, there were also estimates of 15,000 people who would die, and that's luckily not true. Um, so nobody knows it's a new virus, it's a new disease. Uh, there is some logic to it coming with an influenza to make the winter a horrible one, but I think we are much more pre better prepared with systems like Dr. Kaspi presented. Uh, we could identify outbreaks very soon and install uh, preventive measures. So I'm not that pessimistic. I don't think we will have a, a doomsday winter, but I may be wrong. Thank you. Okay, and maybe the last one for Professor Ashkenazi. If someone sneezes on a surface and then leaves, can a different person come a few hours later, touch the surface and get infected, or is it spread mostly through direct contact? And thank you. First, just to elaborate on the previous questions, Another quotation, it is said that it's hard to do predictions, especially of the future. So we don't know, but uh, 
I'm also optimistic. I think we have now rapid diagnostic tests for influenza and for coronavirus by PCR. We can isolate the patients. Uh, typical, the other influenza viruses are seen mainly in the spring. So I'm not sure. If, obviously, we might have uh, both viruses, but I'm not sure. No one knows if we'll have another uh, wave of uh, coronavirus. Now, to answer the question, as with the hydroxychloroquine, it's not so simple. We know that the coronavirus survives on surfaces. It has been shown. It can survive for days, depends upon the surface. However, a further study that was done showed that the number of viruses who sur that survive and their infectivity is much lower. So although the virus survive, can recover it from surfaces, but the numbers are low, what we call the inoculum is low, and the infectivity, the activity of the virus is also lower than usual. So, so in general, it's more direct uh, aerosol, airborne infection spread by the nasal secretions. You know, but if someone will sneeze on a surface and a few minutes afterwards someone will touch it, obviously you can be infected. But it's less, less common, a less common way of uh, transmitting the disease. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we've got enough and we've run a fashionable 12 minutes over time. Yeah. So I think we can tick that box. Uh, thank you very much for our experts. Thank you to Adrian and Verit and thank you to Robin. And of course, thank you to the attendees. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, it's been a fantastic uh, honour to be part of such a great event and I look forward to seeing many, many more events where we can all come together as we should during this time to work together on helping each other get through this and hopefully we will see one of you talented doctors come forward with with a cure hopefully very soon thank okay, you so much thank you. Yes. thank you go, go ahead bye -bye. thank you bye -bye. thank you to everyone the thank panel. you everyone Thanks for joining thank us bye-bye thank you thank everyone. you special thanks for professor ashkenazi dr Oren kaspi dr Norbyberg, and australian friends of rambam chair robbing and to you harriet and thank you adrian from my ariel university thank you all and thank you for all the participants have a good night thank you good night everybody good night good night bye. 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 Bye.